So today, if you didn't get the memo, uh, we're going to be doing a special class, inshallah ta'ala. So we're going to break a bit from the first, as in the great first, and we're going to talk about the first plague. And I want to talk about why. Um, with this whole thing going on with coronavirus and the way that it's being highlighted and the way that it's spreading around the world, there is, subhanAllah, this, this tendency to think of the worst case scenario, especially with everything else that's happening out in the world today. There are also a lot of discussions that become hyper-focused on the fiqh, on the jurisprudence of what to do with coronavirus. So now you start to see some of the fatwa councils issuing fatawa about the extent to which we should or shouldn't uh, gather or congregate. You know, Allahu alam, if there comes a time where, you know, Salat al-Jum'ah, we're not supposed to come to Salat al-Jum'ah, what point do we stop shaking hands with one another? And it's very hard to change habits, but at what, what point do we start um, actually changing some of our habits that we feel uh, very passionate about as they, as they uh, pertain to ibadat, as they pertain to acts of worship. There's also the question of Umrah and Hajj, right? You know, SubhanAllah, imagine the people that went out for Hajj. This is something that's practically unknown at this time. Imagine if we went, those people that went out for Umrah uh, and were turned back. Right? They would have never thought, especially if you live in the United States and you know, you're, it's, it's so easy to make it to Umrah or to make it towards Hajj, you would never think in a hundred years, so that's my kid, All right. <laughs> so Hajj and Umrah. Uh, typically those that go to Umrah or that go to Hajj never have to think about any type of difficulty. Right? It's, you, know, you pay the amount of money, you make it out to Umrah, you make it out to Hajj and you come back. Right? And this is probably the first time in recent memory that something like this would happen where you'd have people that paid for, you know, and we always talk about the VIP packages and you know, you get these five star experiences and SubhanAllah, people that studied the hotels they would stay in for Umrah, uh, studied, you know, the exact routes, perfectly planned their trip so that they'd get back at a certain amount of time, at a certain period of time and they made their way over to uh, Umrah and they were turned away in Medina. Can you imagine some people being put back on a plane in Medina? Um, and on their way back. So this is really uh, unique and, and unprecedented, at least for our community, uh, to experience something like this. So there's a, a hyper fiqh dimension to this that, that I see coming up now about how people want to discuss this. And I want to discuss this from a very spiritual perspective. And I thought the best way to do that is to go back to the most similar thing that we can find that the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ experienced, especially since we're talking about the firsts, right? We're talking about the first this and the first that. So let's talk about the first plague, okay, and what this meant for them. And before we get to that plague, a few notes from the Prophet ﷺ. Number one, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he said, سَأَلْتُ Rabbi Azza wa Jal thalath. I asked Allah for three things. And he said, فَأَعْطَانِي إِثْنَتَيْنِ Allah gave me two things, and he prevented me, مَنَعْنِي wahida. He prevented me, from one of those things. And the first thing the Prophet ﷺ said, سَأَلْتُ رَبِّي أَن لَا يُهْلِكُنَا بِمَا أَهْلَكَ بِهِ الْأُمَمْ I asked Allah that He would not destroy us whole in, in an entire fashion the way that previous nations were destroyed. Whether that is through a disease, through some sort of natural disaster, but the point is that this is an act of God, right? When something happens that's outside of a people, but some sort of disaster comes and it wipes out an entire ummah, as we read about some of those nations that were wiped out before. So I asked Allah that my ummah would not be wiped out in similar fashion, okay? The second thing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, أَلَّا يُظْهِرَ عَلَيْنَا عَدُو مِنْ غَيْرِنَا That He does not allow an external enemy to wipe us out. Meaning as an ummah, we're never wiped out. We, we might suffer heavy casualties, right? You know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he mentioned that we would be like a meal on a table and the people gathering to feast upon us. That's the example of us and the other nations. But at no point will this ummah be wiped out entirely by an external enemy. So he said that Allah granted me that. And then I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah yaj'ala ba'suna that Allah does not cause the misfortune of this ummah to be due to some sort of division on the inside. 
Meaning Allah does not cause us to be disunited or that Allah unites our hearts. And Allah did not grant the Prophet Sallallahu that request. The reason is that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will take care of the external circumstances. But in Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. This is one manifestation of Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change the condition of themselves. You cannot expect Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala when he has protected us from everything on the outside, given us everything to succeed on the inside, to not at least give us the responsibility to not become divided amongst ourselves and in the process, tafshalu, you would fail and you would lose your, you would lose your momentum, you would lose any of your uh, momentum forward as an ummah, as a nation. So the first part of this hadith is of course the important one, that at no point, we know that at no point this ummah will be wiped out entirely by any sort of disease, by any sort of natural disaster, that we will suffer, suffer earthquakes, will suffer diseases, but the ummah will survive at least to some extent anything that would happen in the world. However, with that knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ was the person if the wind just blew a little bit hard, or if there was a long period where there was no rain, or there was a lot of rain, right? But the point is, is that the slightest change in weather, the slightest change in circumstance, the Prophet ﷺ would be driven to what? He'd be driven to salah. He'd be driven to prayer, he'd be driven to dua, he'd be driven to supplication. And so we learn so many of the duas of the Prophet ﷺ for things that other Sahaba thought were minor and insignificant. Now if something traumatic was about to happen to the Ummah, the Prophet ﷺ would have been the first to gain that knowledge. But the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, was, was showing the Ummah by example how to react. Anything happens, right? A lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse, the Prophet ﷺ did not say that you know things bad things are going to happen now because of the eclipse but it's a sign of Allah's complete control over this world and this is something that is actually extremely important it's a gem that i feel like we usually lose when we talk about khusuf and kusuf when we talk about the eclipse the prophet ﷺ was not responding to some mythology right that oh no something bad is going to happen in fact the prophet sallallahu said ash-shams wal qamar ayatan min ayatillah the sun and the moon are two signs of the signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right no, they, nothing happens to them because of the death of anyone or because of the birth of anyone so the prophet sallallahu alaihi was shedding those types of things but what is the spiritual lesson of that it is to show that even if you are to control everything within your power you're the healthiest person alive you eat right, you protect yourself, you wear the things that you need to wear, you have a strong army, you have the best shelter, you're fortified in terms of your immune system, fortified in terms of your health, fortified in terms of your army. Even if all of that is true, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still in complete control and you are so vulnerable. Look at the tornado, subhanAllah, you know, it's not even because of the, the you know, I think something significant is happening tonight, I'm not sure what it is, it's a halaqa, right? Uh, but, but in seriousness, I mean, subhanAllah, this tornado that, that ripped through Tennessee and over 25 people killed last night. You know, like you, you didn't even really, it's not really anywhere, it's, it's buried in the headlines, which is usually the case with international uh, news stories, right? But 25 people, right? I mean, who would think, right? But it's, these are the things that, that we're supposed to learn, your complete vulnerability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, right? Where you think you have it all figured out, and Allah reminds you, you actually have nothing figured out, right? That you are vulnerable to an insect bite, you're vulnerable to some weather change, you're vulnerable to a sudden health uh, tragedy or crisis, that you don't have the antibiotic for everything, you don't have the vaccination for everything. No matter how advanced you get, you're still vulnerable. No matter how powerful you are, you're still vulnerable. So these things are meant to show us, demonstrate our vulnerability, and in the process of becoming more, uh, becoming more aware of our own vulnerability, draw us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way the Prophet ﷺ was drawn back to Allah with any of these things. Now specifically, when it comes to this concept of a mass health scare, right, which when you read in, in the history of at least the Arabs, you'll, you'll see, you'll see the, the word ta'un, which specifically refers to a plague, right, which would arise out of animals transferring something to humans or insects or something along those lines. However, really what they were talking about are, you know, mass deaths that occur uh, due to some sort of, of, of some, some sort of contagious disease. And of course, 
um, you know, that was the way that they would describe it, um, the plagues in particular, Amwas. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu tells us something very important here. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in an authentic hadith from Aisha, he says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَذَابًا يَبْعَثُهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ It was a punishment that Allah would send upon whomever He willed. So that tells you that a plague or something similar, a famine, drought, some sort of disease that spreads amongst the people and, and takes them um, in great numbers, could indeed be a punishment. It is a form of punishment. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَجَعَلَهُ اللَّهَ رَحْمَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Then Allah made it a mercy for the believers. فَلَيْسَ مِنْ عَبْدٍ يَقَعُ الطَّعُونَ فَيَمْكُثُ فِي بَلَدِهِ صَابِرًا يَعْلُمُ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يُصِيبَهُ إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ He said, so there is not anyone from the servants of Allah who is struck by the plague. And then he stays in his place, or stays in her place, patient, sabiran. And then, the, so the Prophet ﷺ said, you have to have sabr. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, يَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يُصِيبَهُ إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ And he knows that nothing strikes him except that Allah has willed it. So there are two conditions that the Prophet ﷺ put. You are patient as you stay in your place, and you have full knowledge that nothing strikes me except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written it uh, for me, illa kana lahu mithlu ajr shaheed except that that person will have the reward of a martyr. That person will have the reward of a shaheed. Remember, shahada is not due to the splitting of limbs or, the, or, or bleeding in a battlefield. It is the truthfulness of that person as they encounter that, their full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the notions of sacrifice, patience, knowledge that there is something in the hereafter that is worth more than this world, that nothing good or bad happens to them except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees it. So it is the, it's the niyyah, right? And so the Prophet sallallahu says that if a person is struck with something like this and they stay in their home and they're patient and they recognize that this is the qadr of Allah, meaning they don't spend their last days saying, if only I didn't go there. If, you know, it was this person and that person. I knew it was that person in Jum'ah. I knew it was that person there. Or uh, someone, uh, Ain, Hasad, you know, right away, right? We go straight to the evil eye. Somebody put Ain on us, right? Somebody put the evil eye. You start going to all the, no. At that point, you are just in complete, complete self-assurance. Allah wrote this for me, therefore it's a rahmah for me, it's a mercy for me. And that person knows that they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that a shaheed will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said another hadith from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, الطَّعُونُ شَهَادَةٌ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمْ That the ta'un, that a plague is the cause of martyrdom for every Muslim. Now is it just a plague in the true sense of the word, meaning it had to be transmitted and recognized indeed as a plague? No, there are multiple hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, so for example, Hadith Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala anhu in a tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, الشهداء خمس, the, the martyrs are five people. Those who die of a plague, those who die of a stomach illness, something within the stomach, okay? And again, these terms are not specific medical terms, they're broader terms to help you understand, right? Or, you know, what would cause death and those types of things. Someone that dies of a stomach illness. Then the Prophet said someone that dies drowning or someone that dies being crushed by something. And the martyr in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the one who dies in a tradition as a traditional way in terms of as how martyrdom was understood. Uh, one of my teachers actually explained this hadith in an interesting way. Um, and, and I didn't find a sharh, but it, it is, you know, he, he talks about these ahadith in terms of the uh, in terms of the understandings. And he said that if you look at the way the Prophet uh, divided it, he talked about two types of a health illness, and then he talked about uh, death from the outside as something that would fill you on the inside, which is water in terms of drowning, or something that would, uh, would blunt force, right? Something that would hit you on the outside or fall on you from the outside. So it's as if the Prophet ﷺ is describing the full health of a person. And in those four categories, the Prophet ﷺ is encompassing many things. The Prophet ﷺ said in another uh, hadith from Abdullah ibn Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, um, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that being killed in the cause of Allah is martyrdom, dying of the plague is martyrdom, 
Uh, dying in pregnancy is martyrdom. Dying of drowning is martyrdom. Dying of burning is, mar I'm sorry, dying of burning or in a fire is a form of shahada. Uh, the inflammation of the lungs, if someone dies due to some sort of inflammation of the lungs or something, a respiratory illness, that's a form of shahada as well. So the Prophet ﷺ was even more expansive in some of these ahadith. The point is, is that when these things happen out of our, uh, out, outside of our control, if the believer is struck with something of these sorts, and the believer is patient and has that full tawakkul in Allah, then it is indeed a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the result of that is shahada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us shahada in, the, in, in, in a way uh, that is most pleasing to him. Allahumma ameen. Uh, now the context of Amwas in particular, uh, Ta'un Amwas, which is the plague that I'm going to talk about inshallah ta'ala, it's actually narrated at an interesting time from the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ did not live to see this plague, but he prophesied it. So Awf ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, I went to the Prophet ﷺ during Ghazwa Tabuk, the Battle of Tabuk, and he was sitting in a leather tent alayhi salatu wasalam. Was Tabuk a good battle or a bad battle? Good, bad, what do you all remember from Tabuk? What, did it go well? Did it not go too well? What was it? I just heard a bunch of things. What was it? It went well. Okay. So Tabuk is, a, you know, you're in the midst of a battle. You're in the midst of, you know, a, a very difficult victory. But the point is, is that think about the mindset of people as they're in battle. And you're still fighting in the context, right, of the Prophet ﷺ, which was really survival, right? Survival. And the Prophet ﷺ is sitting in his tent. And it's really interesting what he says. The Prophet ﷺ said, count six things. Count six things. Sitta. Baini wa baini yaday sa'ah. Six things between I and the Day of Judgment. What an interesting time to talk about the Day of Judgment. Now, if you're in the midst of battle, you're, you're seeing that, that's a time you're, you know, you're thinking about the hereafter, you're thinking about all of these different things, you're thinking about some of these difficulties. Count six things between I and the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said, the first one, Moti, my death, my death. The Prophet ﷺ said that the, 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 the time, if you were to describe the lapse of time, or, or the amount of time between my death and the Day of Judgment, the Prophet said it's like these two fingers, meaning the difference in height between these two fingers, right? So this is how much time has passed of the world's existence. What remains is like this time, okay? The closeness of the death of the Prophet to the Day of Judgment. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ثُمَّ فَتْحُ بَيْتِ المقدس. And then, the conquest of Jerusalem. Okay, the conquest of Jerusalem. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ مَوْتَانْ يَأْخُذُ فِيكُمْ كَكُعَاصِ الْغَنَمْ The Prophet ﷺ said, and then after that, a plague that will afflict you and kill you in great numbers, just like a plague that would run through sheep. Okay, so imagine a disease that runs through a flock of sheep and you see them fall rapidly and in great numbers, the Prophet ﷺ said that that would be the third thing. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, and I'll mention the other three just to finish the hadith, he said that you would have an increase of wealth to such an extent that even if one is given a hundred dinars, he would not be satisfied. So wealth comes upon the ummah, the ummah experiences a great period of wealth. Then he said ﷺ, an affliction, a fitna that no household, Arab household would escape. And then he said ﷺ, a truce between you and Ben al-Asfar, which are the Byzantines, the Romans, who will betray you and attack you under 80 flags. Under each flag will be 12,000 soldiers. So the implication is that the Roman Empire would not be the traditional Roman Empire. It would break into nations and different flags, and those nations would gather against you. After you had a peace with them, they would gather against you. So anyway, I'm not going to go through the other three. I'll just go through the first three. And you can kind of understand now why the Sahaba thought the Day of Judgment was in their time. Like if you, if you think 
The day of judgment is around the corner and imminent. First of all, every generation of Muslims thought that. And the Sahaba themselves really thought that they were going to experience Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Why? The Prophet Sallallahu death was in what year? Year 6... I want you guys to get these numbers down. 633. Okay? The Prophet Sallallahu death was in the year 633. Okay? You witnessed that moment in the Masjid of the Prophet where the entire community was built around him and then you lost him وسلم, he passed away وسلم, and he mentioned the closeness of his death to the Day of Judgment and then literally in order Fathu Bayt, Bayt al-Maqdis the opening of Jerusalem was in the year 637 okay so just a few years pass and then you have the opening of Jerusalem and then you have the plague that the Prophet وسلم, was talking about of Amwas Ta'un Amwas, which was the year 639, and the town of Amwas is a town in Palestine. It's only about 25 miles historically away from Jerusalem. Okay, only about 25 miles away from Al Quds. Okay, so you've seen three of the six signs pass just like that in a matter of a few years. So if you if you feel as you're kind of watching everything happening in the world today. And you're like, it must be Yawm Al-Qiyamah coming around the corner. SubhanAllah, imagine if you lived in that time. The, the sentiment that would exist had you seen all of that happen at that time. Okay? So let's get to this plague. 639 in the town of Amwas. The Khilafah is the Khilafah of who? Who would have been the Khalifa at that point? Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Muslims had just entered into Jerusalem. They just settled Al-Quds. They, of course, were, were, uh, were expanding in Asham, in greater Syria at the time, and actively, obviously, um, at war with, with elements of the Roman Empire, with the Byzantines at the time. And suddenly, this plague breaks out. Sta'un breaks out. And this was not the first plague in that area. In fact, if you read, less than 100 years uh, before that, the plague of Justinian, the plague of Justinian, which killed about 15% of the world's population, 25 million plus people, okay? Murder, uh, not murdered, killed in that plague uh, that recurred over some time. So it wasn't limited to a, a short period of time, but it recurred, it spread uh, to many parts of the world, and it arose out of that area. So you, you already had a plague that ripped through, particularly the Byzantines, by the way, the Roman Empire. Uh, that suffered the most due to that plague. So that's less than 100 years uh, before that. This one, Ta'un Amwas, was not nearly as significant as that, except that it took hundreds of Sahaba, thousands of Tabi'in, right? So the, the earliest Muslims, some of the earliest Muslims would die in this plague. In this plague, it would be about 25,000 people uh, that would die in Ta'un Amwas. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu was the Khalifa. He heard about it. And by the way, I don't want people to, to mix this with Am al-Ramada, the drought that happened in Medina, which was separate. So this is a disaster that came immediately after that. Um, and we know the stories of Umar ibn Khattab anhu, himself almost dying in that drought that took place um, in, in the same time period in Medina. So this is first Ta'un Amwas. Umar ta'ala anhu heard about it and Umar anhu decided to make his way over to Asham uh, to be with his people. Umar radiallahu anhu was a man who if the people were suffering, he wanted to suffer with them. He said, How could I claim to be a shepherd of, of, my, of, of my flock? And I'm not touched with what they are touched with. So I have to go struggle with them. I've got to go strive with them. So he intended to go there and to fight it himself. As he was about to enter, some of the Sahaba came to meet him. And it was typical that the generals would come out. Some of the generals would come out to meet the Khalifa before he enters anyway, right? To sort of inform him about the situation as it's taking place. Abu Ubaidah al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu was of course the leader at that time. He came out to Umar radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu asked him about the situation. Abu Ubaidah said, we are falling like sheep. Using the same language of the Prophet sallallahu people are dying right and left. And this was the first time the Sahaba had ever encountered uh, something of this sort. So Umar radiallahu anhu started to take shura from the people. He started to consult from them about what his next step should be. Some of them told Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you should return to Medina with your core because 
you should not be struck with what they are struck. That, you know, it's catastrophic as it is, but if you die from this, and if the people that you came with die from this, then that spells doom for the ummah, right? That has much greater implications for the entire ummah. So you have not yet entered. Go back to Medina, take those that are with you, and don't get touched by this. Some of the Sahaba told Umar radiallahu anhu, tawakkal ala Allah, trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you should come in and you should fight this uh, with the people. They need to see uh, that leadership. Most of the people told Umar radiallahu anhu, it's important for you to go back to Medina. And if, even if you survive this, then you might take some of its effects back to Medina and imagine this spreading through Medina as well. Right? Think about the discussions that they're having right? with what's available to them at the time. So Umar radiallahu anhu listened to, the, to them and when the stakes were not just his health, but the stakes were the entire ummah, that this means that Medina could suffer, that the Khilafah could fall apart, that so much could happen. Umar radiallahu anhu is obviously thinking about the survival of Islam, he's not thinking about himself. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, if that's the case, then we should go back. Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu says a very famous statement to him. He says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Atafirru min qadarillah. O commander of the believers, are you running away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Atafirru min qadarillah. Like, are you really going to run away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha said, Law qalaha ghayruka ya Abu Ubaidah. I wish someone other than you would have said that, O Abu Ubaidah. Because he loves him so much, respects him so much, holds him in such high esteem. And so for, he, he hated to have that difference of opinion with Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu. And he, he, he had hoped that a statement like that would come from someone else. Now, by the way, there's an irony uh, to this moment. The most famous moment of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu entering into Jerusalem, okay, or entering into Palestine was when he entered into Jerusalem. And remember his statement, نَحْنُ قَوْمُنَ عَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ وَإِنْ اِبْتَغَيْنَ الْعِزَّةِ لِغَيْرِهِ يَذَلَنَ اللَّهُ That we are people that Allah honored with Islam. And if we seek it through other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us, right? What happened in that moment, which was the previous time he came, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu saw Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu coming in with a servant on the camel, because Umar radiallahu anhu took turns with the servant on who would ride. Umar fell into a, a, a puddle of mud on his way and he only had one cloth. So this grand reception was in Jerusalem for him. You had, you know, you, you had the leadership of the Romans, the leadership of all of these religious communities waiting for Umar radiallahu anhu to come into Jerusalem. And he comes in and he's got the servant on the camel, the Khalifa, and he's got a, a, a patched up cloth covered in mud and he's walking in and Abu Ubaidah goes up to him and Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu to, tells him, not this, this isn't, how, you know, it's like you should have dressed for the occasion, you know. <laughs> this isn't the way that you make your entrance. We've been preparing the ground here in Jerusalem all this time in Al-Quds. The Christians were excited to meet you. The Jews were excited to meet you. The people were going to meet our Amir al-Mu'mineen, the great Umar. And this is how you came in. And that's when Umar radiallahu anhu, he, he, he pushed Abu Ubaidah and he told him, Ya Abu Ubaidah, oh Abu Ubaidah, we are a people who Allah honored through Islam. So now, subhanAllah, the irony is that it seems like Abu Ubaidah is the one who is admonishing Umar, right? For what appears to, to seem like a lack of religiosity, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I wish someone other than you, O Abu Ubaidah, would have said it. He said, نَفِرُّ مِنْ قَدَرِ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ قَدَرِ اللَّهِ We are fleeing from the decree of Allah to the decree of Allah. We're fleeing, we're running away from the decree of God to the decree of God. This is probably the most important lesson to cease from this entire thing, okay? Tawakkul, trust in Allah, is not foolishness. Trust in Allah is not recklessness. Trust in Allah is al-akhdu bil-asbab, to do your part and then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To intentionally put yourself in harm's way, and by the way, this is for the grand and for the micro, because some people really, really, really mess this concept up, okay? To put yourself in a position of harm or to not take harm seriously because you say it's okay. Allah Musta'an, Allah will take care of it, it's all right. That's not courage, that's not trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anything, you know, that is a means of, of showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
your lack of wanting to do more to keep yourself in a situation where you could do more to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no, this is not how it works in terms of tawakkul, in terms of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umar is telling Abu Ubaidah, I'm doing my part. We're running away from the decree of Allah to the decree of Allah. We can't escape the decree of Allah no matter where we go. But Allah tells us to do our part to protect ourselves and to do what's best to avoid harm. And so that's why we're doing that. As Umar anhu said that, Abdurrahman ibn Awf anhu approached the gathering. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf had heard what the debate was about. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf said, I, I have some knowledge of this from the Prophet He said, I heard the Prophet say, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ بِالطَّاعُونَ بِأَرْض If you hear about, بِالطَّاعُونِ بِأَرْض If you hear that a plague has struck a land, فَلَا تَدْخُلُوهَا Then do not enter into that land. وَإِذَا وَقَعَ بِأَرْضٍ وَأَنْتُمْ بِهَا فَلَا تَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا And if it strikes a place and you are in it, then do not leave that place. So again, the Prophet ﷺ say, if you hear about the outbreak of a plague in a land and you're not in it, don't go to it. And if you are in a place where the plague strikes, don't leave it. Right? What does that sound like? The word that's the Q word. Right? Quarantine, right? This idea of, of, of trying to contain the harm in one place as much as possible. Now think about it. You have Hajj coming up and you're in Al Quds. What if you want to go to Hajj? Right? Like, what, what a test to the Sahaba, right? Think about the implications of this. Don't leave the place if you're there to not spread it. Instead, keep it contained, be patient. Seek the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything will, will proceed as He decrees. And at the same time, if you hear about it somewhere, don't go to it. So subhanAllah, it's, it's an, early, uh, an early initiative, if you will, or an early uh, pretext to this idea of, of quarantine. Now, by the way, quarantine, of course, in a formal sense, doesn't come until the 14th century. Um, so it actually, this idea of quarantine, which is Latin for the word 40, Right, because when it, when uh, when plague when the Black Death, as they call it, broke out in the 14th century, uh, Venice had established a system that any ship should lay at its anchor for 40 days. So it comes from that word of 40. So that's the official terminology there. However, this is pretty much what the Prophet Sallallahu the hikmah, the, the, the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu in in the way he's teaching us to keep things contained into areas as much as possible, and. Umar radiallahu anhu as a result of that, once Abdurrahman ibn Awf said that, then it basically settled the debate. The Prophet said it. Okay? And of course, Umar radiallahu anhu would agree, his opinion would usually agree with revelation. Okay? SubhanAllah, he was not aware of that hadith that Abdurrahman ibn Awf narrated, which is narrated by others as well at the time, and it agreed with the opinion that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had eventually uh, made. Now again, Umar, as he turns back to go to Medina, was Umar a selfish person? Was Umar worried about himself? No, because when, when something similar struck Medina, Umar radiallahu anhu went out of his way to suffer the worst of what the people suffered. Right? He didn't eat what people could not eat. People would bring him meat, he didn't take meat. He found his son carrying a piece of watermelon in the home. Umar radiallahu anhu said, no one's eating watermelon until the whole ummah can eat watermelon, even if he bought it from his own money. Right? We're all going to struggle together. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the people, should struggle the most of them. So Umar radiallahu anhu almost died in the, 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 uh, the drought that would strike uh, Medina. In fact, subhanAllah, is a beautiful statement from Umar radiallahu anhu that once he was sitting, he was so hungry, uh, death was so imminent, he hadn't eaten for so long that his stomach was making noises. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he's tapped his stomach and he said, Qarqir, aw la tuqarqir, wallahi la tashba' hatta yashba' al-Muslimin. He said, you could growl or not growl, I swear you will not be filled until the Muslims eat. SubhanAllah, disciplining himself, like I don't care how much I suffer, I will strive with the people. So that's Umar radiallahu anhu's way. But this was of course for the survival of Islam and the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu Now when Umar radiallahu anhu got back to Medina, he worried about Abu Ubaidah. He wanted Abu Ubaidah to come with him. So he wrote Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu a message. He knew that if he told him, I'm worried about you, come to Medina, Abu Ubaidah would say no. So he sent him an ambiguous message. 
He said to Abu Ubaidah, Inna li bika haja, I need you for something. And so when you receive this, فَإِذَا جَاءَكَ كِتَابِي هَذَا فَقْدِمْ عَلَيَّ Once this letter of mine reaches you, come to me right away. So he left it kind of ambiguous. Abu Ubaidah read the letter, رضي الله عنه, um, in Palestine at the time, and he laughed. So he actually laughed when he read the letter, the people around him, because he knew what Umar was trying to do. So he sent back Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه, and this is the Amin of this Ummah, the trustworthy one of this Ummah. SubhanAllah, Abu Ubaidah Jarrah is an amazing human being. And inshallah, one day we'll, we'll get to go deep into his seerah. He responded to Umar رضي الله عنه, and he says, إِنَّنِي لَا أَرْغَبُ عَنْ جُنْدِي He said, I'm not going to leave my troops behind. وَأَرْضَى بِقَضَاءِ رَبِّي And I'm satisfied with the decree of my Lord. And to die of this is shahada. Meaning, I'm not going to be the one to leave my troops behind and then they all get decimated by this plague. And I come and I survive it with you. So Umar radiallahu anhu wanted to protect him. Abu Ubaidah knew that, even though Umar was intentionally ambiguous in the letter that he sent to him. So he said that it'll be shahada. Umar radiallahu anhu was pacing in Medina, waiting for the letter to come back. Right? He wanted Abu Ubaidah to survive so badly. He loved him so much. And so it was either Abu Ubaidah that was going to come back or a letter that would come back. Instead, a letter came back. So Umar radiallahu anhu took the letter, the Sahaba gathered around him. He read the letter and he wept. Okay, he started to cry heavily. So much so that the people around him said, uh, did Abu Ubaidah die? He said, no, but it's only going to be a few days. There's no way he's going to survive this, right? It's only a matter of a few days. And subhanAllah, uh, it was only a few, it was indeed sometime after that the next letter that came was that Abu Ubaidah had passed away radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu remained behind um, as things started to get worse in Palestine. He called for Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he asked him to look for a place that they could take those that are infected out immediately and put them in one place from the rest of the population. So now let's separate the population from the rest. Anyone that's sick, let's go ahead and separate them at this point. Abu Musa radiallahu anhu said, okay. Uh, he got home, Abu Musa went home that day and he found that his wife was struck with it. And the wife of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari died that same day radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa anha. So then Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as Abu Musa was, was struck obviously with what just happened to his own household, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he took his camel and he started to look himself for an area that he could quarantine some of that population, that he could put that population in. And just a few hours after that, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu suddenly fell ill and he fell down and he looked like he was about to die too. And subhanAllah, when he died, the people came to him, they rushed to him as he was about to die and he gave this beautiful nasiha, this beautiful advice to people as he was dying. He said, Inna Allah kataba ala bani Adam al maut Allah has written death upon the children of Adam, fa kulluhum mayitun, and so all of them will die. He said, fa aqalahum man kana atwa li rabbihi wa a'mala li ma'adihi. He said, and so the smartest child of Adam is the one who is the most obedient to his Lord, wa a'mala li ma'adihi, and who has done most to prepare for their journey. So the smartest of the children of Adam are those who have done most in terms of obedience to their Lord and to prepare themselves for the journey. And then he died radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he was only about 58 years old at the time. So Abu Ubaidah was not even 60 at the time. And before he died, he appointed Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the Amir uh, of those people. Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he cried and he eulogized Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu and he said, Imra'an lillahi aminan wa kana Allahu fi nafsihi azeema that he was a man who was sincere, truthful to his Lord, trustworthy with his Lord. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ عَظِيمًا And Allah was great, in, or he perceived the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a special way, that he had a special reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in him. When Umar radiallahu anhu found out that Abu Ubaidah died, if you want to know the significance of the death of Abu Ubaidah alone, Okay, some of you might remember by the way is a narration where Umar radiallahu anhu had wished that he could have a whole room full of Abu Ubaidahs. Abu Ubaidah was not a replaceable person and so when he passed away, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wept and he said, Wallahi, this is significant. 
He said, if Abu Ubaidah was alive, I would have appointed him to be the Khalifa. Hear that? If Abu Ubaidah was alive, and Umar does not make empty oaths, I would have put him as a successor to me. And he said, and I would have met Allah in peace. For I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, every ummah has an ameen, every ummah has a, trust, has, has a trustworthy one. And the ameen of this ummah is Abu Ubaidah. So I would have met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, and they asked me, and Allah asked me, who did you put in charge after me? I would have said, I put the one who the Prophet ﷺ called the ameen of this ummah the trustworthy one of this ummah. And the greatest uh, quality of leadership is integrity, is trustworthiness. But he lost him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And by the way, when you think of Mu'adh, you're probably thinking of an old man. Because his time with the Prophet Sallallahu is so rich, right? The Prophet Sallallahu sent him to Yemen. The Prophet Sallallahu as an ambassador. The Prophet Sallallahu made him an imam of the people. The Prophet ﷺ called him of the muftis, the, 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 the most scholarly, the wisest in judgment of the ummah. The Prophet ﷺ, as he bid him farewell, what did he tell him? Ya Mu'ad, I love you. Can you imagine, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, as he's bidding you farewell, he embraced him and he told him, Ya Mu'ad, I love you. Don't forget to say at the end of every salah. Anyone know? Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. So we take it from that hadith. Don't forget to say at the end of every salah, Oh Allah, enable me. Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik to remember you, to thank you, and to perfect or to excel in my good deeds with you. So he's, he's one of the people that wrote the Quran, Kutab al Wahi. He's a great faqih, a great jurist. He has a rich history, right? How old do you think he is at this point? About 33 years old. Okay, he's in his early 30s, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Because he embraced Islam as a teenager and he joined the Prophet Sallallahu as a young man and the Prophet Sallallahu immediately uh, put him in a high place. So this is, this is still a very, very, very young man, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he's now in charge of Ard al-Sham, of the Muslims that are in greater Syria. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, when he saw the death of Abu Ubaidah, he said, this is really important. He said, إِنَّهُ رَحْمَةُ رَبِّكُمْ عَزَّ وَجَلُ وَدَعْوَةُ نَبِيِّكُمْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ وَقَبْضُ الصَّالِحِينَ قَبْلَكُمْ He said that this is a mercy from your Lord. This is a rahma, rahmatu rabbikum, a mercy from your Lord. دَعْوَةُ نَبِيِّكُمْ The prophecy of your Prophet صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ قَبْضُ الصَّالِحِينَ قَبْلَكُمْ And that which has taken some of the righteous before you. And then he said, Allahumma a'ti ala mu'adhin al nasib al awfara min hadhihi rahma Heavy dua. He said, Oh Allah, let the family of Mu'adh get the most, the, the biggest share of this mercy. Let the family of Mu'adh get the biggest share of this mercy. That's a very strong dua. Why? Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, no sooner than him making that dua, Mu'adh radiallahu anhu's two daughters died, two sons and his spouse. His whole family died from the plague. And the last one of his children to die, the last son, the second son, was his favorite son, Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman was a righteous, Abdurrahman ibn Mu'adh. By the way, Abdurrahman ibn Mu'adh ibn Jabal, very famous salah, uh, the very famous uh, wasiyah, the very famous advice that Mu'adh radiallahu anhu said, oh my son, idha qumta bi salatik, when you stand up, for your prayer, then pray as if it is your last prayer. So when the Imam says, Sallu salatan, muwadda, pray as if it is your last prayer, that was the advice of Mu'adh to his son Abdurrahman. So Abdurrahman fell sick, and Mu'adh really was in pain. I mean, he lost his family very quickly. This plague was eating people up. And he spoke to his family, and he said to Abdurrahman, Ya Bunayya, kayfa ant, oh my son, how are you? Abdurrahman responded, الحق من ربك فلا تكوننا من المنترين. The truth is from your Lord, so be not amongst those who have doubts. He recited the ayah. Subhanallah. His son re responded with Quran, that I'm not amongst those who have doubt. That sabr, tawakkul, he does not want to ruin it at any way. And Mu'adh radiallahu anhu responds, وَأَنَا إن شاء الله ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين. He responded with an ayah. And I, am one who you will find me, God willing, to be amongst the patients. 
So the last conversation between Mu'adh and his son was an ayah and an ayah. Subhanallah. The ayah from his son, al haqq min rabbikam, from Surah Al-Baqarah, فَلَا تَكُونَنَا مِنَ الْمُنْتَرِينَ Do not be from those who have doubt. And Mu'adh radiallahu anhu is saying, Surah Al-Safat, that you will find me to be amongst those who are patient. And after Abd rahman died, then Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, also passed away radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Mu'adh saw his whole family die in front of him. And then Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, this person, who the Prophet ﷺ said, I love you, know how much, know that I love you, and gave him such precious advice that reached us as an ummah, uh, also passed away, radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu. SubhanAllah, you're thinking about the, the, the level of the Sahaba uh, that are passing away here. Uh, some, some of you might have read about Sharh Habib ibn Hasana, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sharh Habib passed away in Ta'un Amwas. He was one of the, uh, one of the commanders that actually went into Asham. Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, not Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan ta'ala anhu, very righteous man, who, uh, who actually was one of the main commanders in the battle of Yarmouk, and he passes away in Ta'un Amwas. Al-Fadl ibn Abbas, the brother of Abdullah ibn Abbas, cousin of the Prophet sallam, may Allah be pleased with them all, who narrates pretty much the whole Hajj of the Prophet sallam, because he was the one that was with the Prophet sallam in the Hajj, Al-Fadl, passed away. Suhail ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What a righteous man Suhail was. Suhail who negotiated on behalf of Quraysh against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hudaybiyah. And then became one of the most honorable of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An amazing human being he, he became, subhanAllah. Didn't live to see much of the last days of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but Suhail was a man who became one of the most trustworthy uh, Sahaba, someone who held the Ummah together after he was negotiating on the other side against uh, the Prophet Sallallahu in the Battle of Hudaybiyah. Suhail ibn Amr and his whole family died as well in the, uh, in the, in the plague of Amwas. Abu Malik al-Ash'ari uh, passed away in, the, in, in this plague as well. There's one narration, SubhanAllah, uh, Abu Hashim ibn Utbah. Abu Hashim ibn Utbah, not, um, uh, not as much of a well-known companion radiallahu anhu, but as he was dying, um, you know, he started to cry and Muawiyah asked him, why are you crying? Is it because of the, the pain? Is it because of the pain that you're feeling? Or is it because of something else? And he said, it's because the Prophet Sallallahu had given us advice and I wish I listened to his advice Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, إِنَّهُ لَعَلَّكَ تُدْرِكُ أَمْوَالًا تُقْصَمُ بَيْنَ أَقْوَامٍ وَأَنْتُمْ يَكْفِيكَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ خَادِمٍ وَمَرْكَبْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Prophet ﷺ said, Perhaps you will live to see wealth that will be distributed amongst the people in large amounts. And what would be enough for you is a khadim, is a servant, an amount to ride in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, I wish I would have listened to the Prophet ﷺ. I wish I did not uh, exceed what the Prophet ﷺ had said. Because these were people that went out to Asham, obviously in, in, uh, in battle. Um, and then of course after that, so, so subhanAllah, there was something special about the dua of Mu'adh. When Mu'adh and his whole family passed away, Mu'adh radiallahu anhu said, let us have the greatest share of this rahmah. Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu was, uh, was appointed next, as the Amir next. And Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu was, I mean a strategist, right? He's also a person who was exceedingly talented in terms of war, in terms of battle and arranging armies and things of that sort. Remember Uhud, remember so many different things, right? He's of that caliber in terms of how to arrange people. So Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu, very pragmatic, very smart, very strategically, he stood up and he said, uh, O oh people, when these plagues uh, spread amongst the people, it's like fire. So he said, Let's, we should go to the high grounds away from the affected areas. And every family, instead of trying to quarantine the sick and then you can't keep up, Amr al-Asadillahu anhu said every uh, group of people, or he split them up into groups of people in accordance with the way that he was analyzing them, stay in a tent. And he said, stop coming to any type of public place or any type of convening and get away from this, this town. So they went literally into the mountains and he set up the tents for these small, uh, for the families to basically stay. And at that point, um, the, the plague had ended and no one else had passed away. So subhanAllah, some of them said the Sidq of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, that his family was the last to ingest that plague. And they all passed away as shuhada. 
as Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu had, had wished. So after Amr al-As radiallahu anhu took the Sahaba or took the people to the mountains, um, some time passed and no one else passed away from uh, that plague. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu after this plague had ended, he came back to um, Asham to distribute the inheritance himself. This was a gesture of leadership. This was being amongst the people at that point. And he met with Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Amr radiallahu anhu being who he was, Amr ibn As suggested to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu that they continue to march towards Masr, towards Egypt. Now Masr, Umm dunya Egypt. A lot of people don't know how much of a stronghold Egypt was to the Roman Empire at the time. Anyone here from Skandaria? Where are my Egyptian folks supposed to go? Oh, you're supposed to go, woo! Egyptians from Alexandria, from Skandaria. There we go, mashallah. Skandaria, uh, Alexandria was actually the second largest city of the Roman Empire at the time. Okay, so it was, it was an important stronghold to the Byzantines, to the Roman Empire. The army had just been decimated and Amr ibn As anhu felt confident telling Umar anhu that we're fine, that we've, we've overcome this and we should make our way to, to, to Masr, to Egypt. And that's actually where uh, afterwards Egypt was, uh, was, was uh, opened under Amr ibn As anhu. Now, how do we, what do we take away from all of this? Okay. So a few things, subhanAllah. Um, number one, if people were spared of these types of things because of righteousness, who more righteous than Abu Ubaidah and Mu'ad ibn Jabal? Right? Number two, the same thing could be a punishment for some people and a reward for others. That part is left to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's what the Prophet said. The same disease, the same hardship could be a punishment for one person and it could be a means of shahada and rahma for another person, right? And as we think about, subhanAllah, the spread of something like coronavirus, think about what this means when it spreads amongst our Uyghur brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anyone who dies as a result of that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a means of shahada for them. Allahumma ameen. Think about some of the poor populations, think about the refugee populations, think about the people that can't even be diagnosed, the people that can't be met, can't, can't see a doctor. Think about the implications of this, right? So the same thing that could be a punishment for some, could be a, a reward for others. It can humble an empire and it can honor a people that have been oppressed and that have been made powerless in this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his nasib, has his destiny for every person individually. Second thing, the practicality of this all, right? The Prophet ﷺ taught us to think about these things in a way that was smart, in a way that was effective, in a way that was beneficial, not in a way that was irresponsible and then blame that on the tawakkul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be responsible with these things. This time has not come yet. May Allah Azza wa Jalla protect us, right? But you know, if there came a time where we, we literally, because of, not, let's say we passed this or something else were to happen, but it would be detrimental for the people to gather for a, a core ibadah. Someone might think it's righteousness, right? I'm going to insist on it, but you might be furthering harm. And this is not the way of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. You will not be more righteous than Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, more in accordance with the revelation than Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So taking those practical measures, is not a means of relinquishing sabr. Sabr is the way that you, your, your patience with things as they befall you. It's not causing things to befall you or to befall others. So, you know, following those fiqhi guidelines with a spiritual lens is important. Next thing about this is subhanAllah, the unprecedented idea of being held in Umrah or Hajj. You know, so I was just speaking to someone, uh, you know, who's, who's, who's planning to go to, in my Hajj group and he's, he's like, you know, should I pull back? I told him, I said, listen, this is where those lessons come into play, where you make the sincere niyyah, you make that sincere intention, and you have azima, your niyyah has some teeth, it's got some determination to it, right? You put everything there, you make every intention, you, you do all the scheduling that you have to do, you do all, everything that you have to do, make your intention, make your way. Do you really think a single person that had a sincere intention, that was turned away, lost any of the reward? Absolutely not. This is where those lessons of the Salaf, those lessons of the pious predecessors, 
that didn't have the means to go to Hajj or didn't have the means to go to Umrah or were on the way and stopped or interrupted or the people that wanted to make Hijrah with the Prophet and were unable to do so and Allah assured them of the full reward. This is where your niyyah should actually be more sadiq, should be more truthful. So if anything, your niyyah, your intention should not be wish, wishy-washy right now. It should actually be solidified. Be more sadiq, be more truthful in your desire and intention to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if something happens along the way, then the reward is completely assured for you in, in some other way. The last uh, message is, let it be a reminder of the fragility of life and the inevitability of death. And subhanAllah, I mean, like if you think about the things that happen today, if you don't die from this, you die from that, right? Something very predictable, something unpredictable. Who knows what awaits you and how it awaits you, right? فَلَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى no one knows what will happen tomorrow. No one knows. What land they're going to die in. You don't know how or where you're going to die. You might as well use your life in a way that is beneficial and let these reminders trigger that longing for the hereafter and think the way that Abu Ubaidah said for us to think. And this is this procrastination with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so unhealthy. And I want you to think about how our psychology can at times betray us, okay? Our psychology can betray us with the following. I look at myself, I'm healthy, I've got everything I need to do. I've got something significant coming up or I've got some, some haram that I wanna fulfill or I need to hold back on some ta'a, some obedience. Um, and I'm gonna wait until this date and then maybe I'll consider doing this ibadah now. Maybe I'll consider giving this up. Maybe I'll consider fulfilling this. Maybe I'll do it then because there's no alarm signal in my life right now. If Corona broke out in Dallas, okay, if the coronavirus broke out in Dallas and it was in your neighborhood, how many of those ibadat that you were procrastinating on, those sins that you were committing, those disobediences that you were putting off, getting over, those obediences, those ibadat, those small minor sins that you belittle and say, it's just a part of me, who cares? How many of that stuff, how much of that conversation will suddenly change? Right? It'll all suddenly change. And that is the greatest lesson we can take from all of this from a spiritual perspective. And I think always of what Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said. Imam Ahmed, when he was going through his trials and tribulations, he was getting advice or he was benefiting from the, 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 uh, the thief in jail who said that at some point the lashes don't hurt anymore. He was benefiting from his opponents, benefiting from the scholars, benefiting from everybody, right? He was holding on to every word that he... That, that, that he would hear. As he was being dragged to the prisons, SubhanAllah, he, he heard one man say, Ya Imam, O Imam, innaka ala al-haq, you are upon truth. In lam tuqtan fatamut. If you're not killed, you're gonna die anyway. <laughs> so he's being pulled to the prisons, presumably to be killed. He said, look, if you don't, if you're not killed right now, you'll probably, you're definitely gonna die. So you might as well stay firm on that truth. And Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said, Sadaqt. What a truthful man he was. What a truthful man. SubhanAllah, they gave him that resilience. You know what? Why relinquish something so... Why relinquish this nobility? If death is inevitable anyway. Right? So that idea of don't delay. Think about the inevitability of death. And let the inevitability of death lead you to move away from the procrastination of good deeds. The procrastination of the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and relinquishing some of those disobediences that have become such a part of your life that you're desensitized to them at this point. Think with a greater sense of urgency. Whether the virus breaks out or not in this area, death is inevitable. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from first and foremost from sins that would soil our record when we meet Him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from, this, from, from a harm that is beyond our capacity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the best of this life and the best of the hereafter. Protect our families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al-afu al-afiyah, for pardon and for well-being. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be in a state of well-being in this dunya and in the akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to always be in a state of longing for Him, to always be ready for death and to live our lives in the, to the fullest extent of that which is pleasing to Him and that which is beneficial to us in our akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our brothers and sisters. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for our brothers and sisters that have bala, that have tribulation compounded for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their dead as shuhada and to alleviate their suffering and their pain. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them firm on their deen as they face these tribulations and to allow us to be a part of, uh, of, of alleviating the tribulations.